Hello and welcome back to Handheld Computing. Today we're going to have a look at the GPD Pocket 7. So you'll have seen this device in some of my previous videos and I thought we'd take a closer look. GPD or Shenzhen GPD Technology Co Limited are a Chinese company. They were established in 2013 and are best known for producing ultra mobile computers and handheld gaming consoles running Windows, Ubuntu or Android. The Pocket 7 was successfully delivered in August 2017 after raising raising over three and a half million dollars on the crowdfunding site Indiegogo. It was priced at $399 for pre-orders and $599 once it had been released. As with any of these crowdfunding devices, you have to bear in mind you've got taxes to pay on that and import duty. That said, I snagged this one in 2018 for a little over £200, which I consider an absolute bargain and have been using it ever since. The external casing is plain, there's no badge or indicators of who's made it on the top. On the bottom, we've got an air vent for input and we've got the GPD logo along with a couple of standards. We've got four rubber feet and there's some screws, we'll have a look inside it in a bit. On the back, we've just got the hinge, there's nothing else. Down the left side, also plain, nothing there. On the front, we've just got this little inset so that it's easier to open the lid. And down the side, we've got all the I.O. So we've got the fan output, a USB-C which serves for charging, and you can add a port extender with that, mini HDMI, full-size headphone jack, and a single USB-A. The aluminium casing and slim design definitely give it a look of the MacBook Air. Opening it up, we can see the 7-inch screen. You'll notice there's no camera on any of the bevels, and that's because this doesn't have an inbuilt webcam. We've got a full QWERTY keyboard, about two-thirds size, with a nipple mouse and buttons at the bottom. The spacebar is split into two. A couple of the keys are in unusual positions, but is generally quite usable. Powering it on, we get the GPD logo as it starts to boot. It does take a short while to boot and you might just about be able to hear the fan which is nearly always going when it's turned on. The screen's currently set to full HD. As you can see, things are just a little bit on the small side, um, and so it makes it difficult to use in terms of the touch screen and also to see what's written if you've got an office document. Because of this, I normally set the display to 150%. So while things are still small, it does make it much more usable as you can actually press on the buttons on the start bar. The screen itself is a multi-touch capacitive screen. It's got very good viewing angles. As you can see, and when set to full brightness, is very bright indeed. The dimmest setting is fine for using when it's dark. The keyboard itself is pretty responsive. It's got nice travel and there's a definite click when you press the keys. The one thing I wish they had done would be to dimple the keys, a bit like on the Scion 5 or on the Janada, as this makes finger placement much easier. Your fingers automatically find the dip before they press the key. It saves making mistakes and pressing two keys at once. Not a big issue, you soon get used to it. And certainly for typing documents on the go, this is more than usable. For those times you don't want to leave greasy fingerprints on the screen, the mouse is fairly responsive and the buttons, like the keyboard, have good feedback. Its positioning is not ideal, but for such a small keyboard, I think they've done well. In terms of audio, the sound output from its speaker isn't amazing. It's a little bit tinny, as you might expect. The volume's reasonable, but let's be honest, if you're out and about, you're more likely to either plug your headphones in the 3.5mm jack or connect over the Bluetooth. Let's talk about battery life. So the original spec suggests that this machine is going to run for up to 12 hours. So I'm not sure how they would achieve this. I assume they turned all the radios off, dropped the brightness to its minimum, and just left the computer 
doing nothing. So in my experience, I get more like five or six hours at the most. And that's whether I'm doing light web browsing or watching videos, that kind of thing. If I'm doing anything more processor intensive, it'll drop quite significantly. And if I'm pushing the processor to its max, I can easily get the battery life to drop below two hours and sometimes even below one. That said, for most light tasks, web browsing and doing a few emails here and there, I've no fear that I'm away from a socket for any length of time. The fact it charges with a USB-C is ideal because when I go away, I only need one charger and it can either be charged my phone or charging the Pocket 7. Bear in mind as well the battery is nearly five years old and it's had some heavy use so I'm not surprised that sometimes when I plug a USB device in particularly a hard disk or something that draws a bit of current the screen will actually turn off. It then turns back on a few moments later and we're back in um, and I assume this is just because the battery can't supply enough current. It is a single pouch battery rather than being split into two which would obviously allow more current draw. All in all for a device this size I don't think we can really complain about the battery life. So as I showed you earlier there's only actually six screws on the back of here so it's quite easy to undo them and have a quick look. Lifting the back off, we can see it looks just like the diagram. So we've got this large seven amp hour battery. We can see the eight gig of RAM. We've got the fan with the heat sink, this large heat pipe. There's the connector for the screen here and the connector for the keyboard here. And presumably this is for the mouse. Here's the Broadcom Bluetooth Wi-Fi chip. So none of these parts are user replaceable. You could replace the battery quite easily, but everything else is soldered to the board. So consider this not upgradable. So let's run a couple of benchmarks. So I'm using user benchmark primarily because it's free, but also it's very obvious from their website how they make their money. So this gives me a bit more faith that my data is not being misused. It does a full test on the CPU, on single core and multi-core modes, as well as the GPU. It'll also test the RAM speed and the SSD. So first of all, it's quite clear that this is not a powerful computer from these results. It says that we have extremely low single core performance and not even even good enough for simple web browsing and emails. Now obviously that's not true, we can definitely browse the web without any issues, playing videos on YouTube and sending emails. But I agree, it is a slow single core as really it's a 1.6. Oh yes, it'll turbo to 2.5 but not for very long. And when you turn this device on, if it's been off for a while or if Microsoft has decided it wants to do an update or is running Defender in the background, you very frequently see this. Given as a game score below 25%, which suggests this isn't a gaming machine and it'd be dead right. The GPU is rated at less than 2% and it suggests that we can't do any 3D games. Well, not strictly true, but certainly nothing new, that's for sure. It does at least agree that the 8GB of RAM is enough and that we're running the latest version of Windows 10. Despite what the benchmark might suggest, you can definitely play older 3D games on here, including first-person shooters. This is Halo, which was released in 2003. Be difficult to use the inbuilt mouse. In addition, one of the biggest issues with trying to play games on this device is actually the keyboard layout. The WSD keys don't sit on top of each other and so you end up with a funny finger placement and it's quite difficult. The keys are also a little bit small to get three fingers across ASD which does mean that when you're strafing and moving forwards and backwards you're constantly having to reposition your fingers. Now I'm no expert gamer as you can probably tell so this doesn't make much difference to me but if you are a gamer I would have a look at some of GPD's other devices. Some of them are specifically built around gaming. They have higher specs and a better layout. Again, although the benchmark test suggests otherwise, the Pocket 7 is quite capable of doing some light video editing on the move. It's definitely possible to do some light video editing on the go, but bear in mind the 
time it's going to take you to render the video once you've edited it is going to be a lot higher than on your desktop or high spec laptop. I often use it when I go away diving to take recordings from my GoPro. You can easily stitch the files together, adjust the colour balance to allow for the green effect you get when you're underwater and re-render them. The editing itself doesn't take that long but actually rendering a video in HD takes a very long time and it'll drain the battery fast. The GPD website has their latest crowdfunding device listed on their main page. If we head into the download section, you'll find all the previous devices. It's very easy to find the latest drivers, BIOS updates and firmware. So should you need to do a clean install of Windows 10, it's quite straightforward because all the drivers are easy to download from here. Overall, the GPD Pocket 7 is an excellent device. It's well made, it feels very solid in the hand, it's got good battery life, the screen quality is excellent, and the keyboard is more than usable. If you're gonna do any amount of work on it, I would strongly recommend getting a Bluetooth mouse so you're not taking up one of the ports, and perhaps getting a port extender to add extra I.O., such as this. So this is a USB-C connector, which gives you some memory card slots, a couple of extra USBs, a USB-C power slot, and a full-size HDMI. Perhaps you own one of these, or maybe one of the newer ones. Perhaps you own the One Mix with its convertible screen. If you do, I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to know what you use them for and how you found them in terms of quality. As always, if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Ring that bell so you don't miss the next video. My name's Hugh. This is Handheld Computing. I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching.